Let's just say a word of prayer before we get into the message. Lord, we just thank you for being here today. We thank you, Lord, for the concern, the compassion, Lord, that you've had on our life to save us. And Lord, to send us a word. God, we can read through the whole Bible and if we don't know what fits where and what fits us and what's for us, God, that we can be as lost as can be. But Lord, because you've given us your spirit, I really believe in, in this generation that we're living in. God, you're sending us a word, God, that is timely. Lord, that is, I believe, that is effective, that is affecting our lives, that should be affecting uh, people around us. And so, Father, we just uh, we just appreciate you for it. We just ask, God, that you would anoint my thinking, Lord, my words to be able to say the things, God, that, that you would have said. Move me out of the way. God, do the best that I can do. God, I just ask you to help me and to strengthen me. Lord, it's for your glory. It's for your kingdom. It's to edify. It's to lift up, God. It's to, to grow us up in the things of God. And so, Father, we just ask you for your guidance, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I was, uh, was listening to something yesterday, and I believe that we have to live our life. I know even the way that I've been preaching in the last few months, it seems like it's it's changed uh, to some degree. Uh, I feel... Uh, a greater excitement probably than I ever have my whole Christian life about what God is doing. I believe God's stirring us um, in a way that we've never that we've never experienced before. I know, that, like I said before, and I don't want people to to take take it wrong or to to be feel slighted in any way. I know that we've had things wonderful that's happened in the past. There's been Wonderful things, wonderful ministers, wonderful ministries, wonderful miracles. All these things have happened. And we don't want anybody to feel slighted or think that we're saying something derogatory in any way. But God is doing something today yes. in our generation. And if we don't feel like, like that, if we don't feel that way, then we, we probably need to be stirred in our hearts a, a little bit. And so... And so not only do I feel excited about what God is doing, I feel a sense of, of urgency. I feel a sense to be able to, to soak in the things of God, to soak in the Word of God. Uh, and it's really been astounding. I know I've said this before, being repetitious. But it's not something I can control. There's a hunger in my soul for the things, uh, for the Word. And so God has stirred me, and I feel... Really that uh, I've been going to school for the last few months. And I know that it's not just for me. I know that God is uh, making things available. He's given me that hunger. And so it needs to be in each one of us. And I believe that if it, if it is in each one of us, then it'll affect people around us. And so that's what we want. And so again, the title of this message, if you want to turn to the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 12, Start with verse 43. The title of this message is When We Almost Believe. And again, I, I kind of like uh, the title of messages that are kind of a play on words. When We Almost Believe. Um, you know, I've said for a long time, you're either saved or you're not saved. You're either born again and you're not. There's not almost being saved. There's not almost being born again. And so... Uh, when we almost believe, you know, people seem sometimes to come so close to the things of God. They come right up to, it seems like, uh, that anointing. They come right up to be able to be in the presence of God. But for some reason, they kind of shy away from the things of God. But this is not a time to shy away from the things of God. This is a time to embrace our faith, to embrace what God has been doing in our lives for over the, over the past years, where he has brought us from. It's time, I feel the presence of the Lord, it's time to embrace the journey. It's time to embrace the word that we've heard. We may have heard things in the past and may not kind of understood it or really seen it the way that we should have, but it's time to embrace the word and the spirit of God like we never have before. It's time to embrace 
the things of God, what God is desiring to do like we never have. So let's read here in Matthew chapter 12, starting with verse 43. Before I read it, I've always, uh, this scripture, I have always uh, in the past thought, thought of it more generally as God, uh, or as Jesus is speaking here. It's, it's the Lord speaking to his disciples. It's the Lord speaking uh, to the people here. And I've always thought it more generally as uh, he's talking about individuals. But when I, when I read it, and I read it in the proper context, I want you to listen to it. It says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh, speaking of the spirit, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none. Then he saith, now we, we understand there's demonic forces, don't we? We understand that our world is being led by demonic forces, our governments, our nations. We see people around us that are being led by, by satanic forces. And so it says, he findeth no rest. And it says, then he saith, I will return into the house from which I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty and swept and garnished. Now, part of this is talking about self-reformation. It's talking about trying to do things without the ability of the Holy Ghost to be able to lead us and guide us and give us that direction that we need. There is, it's impossible for self-reformation to last on an individual basis. I've heard people say if somebody dies or a tragic event, you know, we talk about, I was talking about 9-11 the other day and it seemed, it seemed like for, for a few years after 9-11 happened, our churches, and I, this is, we're not the only ones that experienced it where we were at. Churches all across the nation, other people that I talked to, when we were, when we were out singing and, and, and visiting all these other churches, pastors would come to us and, and say, you know, when, when right after 9-11 happened, our churches were full. And as time went on, people began to draw back from the things of God and pretty soon we got to the point to where the churches were almost empty and a pastor would come to me and say you know they were trying to get us to come and sing to try to maybe uh, liven up the church or liven up the community but you know if people's hearts and their desires are not to serve God there's no amount of singing, there's no amount of preaching, there's no amount of anything that can draw people to God it takes a desire for people to, to want to embrace the things of God. But what happened, I really believe during that time period, was people were self-reforming. They seen the tragedies and they seen the things around them and they seen what was happening. And so, so they thought, well, we'll go to church because they felt that sense of urgency. And I believe a lot of it may have been even motivated by fear. And our churches were full. At New Hope, we, we had so many people in the church that all the pews were full and we had to sit the seats in the aisle. And other churches were going through that same thing. But self-reformation does not last. The only thing that has kept me going for almost 40 years, the only thing, and I know that you realize this as well as I do, the only thing that really keeps us going is if we've truly been filled with the Spirit of God. You know, there's, there being, uh, uh, acknowledging Jesus Christ and acknowledging the cross and understanding that there's a heaven and a hell and understanding that there's a Bible and understanding who Jesus was is completely different than being filled with the Spirit of God. People all over the world, they acknowledge all of these things. They acknowledge the Bible. They acknowledge uh, all of the things that they read. They say, yeah, I believe that Jesus died. I understand that he rose from the grave. But there's a big, vast difference in understanding or acknowledging things and then allowing the Spirit of God to come into your life and change you. And so without the Spirit of God, we cannot change ourselves. And so self-reformation doesn't do any good. Fear many times brings people to, to, to church. Fear many times, or, or because a loved one died, or because something tragic happened, it brings them to church. But see, that doesn't last. 
It takes, a, it takes a Holy Ghost feeling. It takes you understanding that you've got to have that anointing living in your life. When I knelt down at the altar, I knew when I got up it wasn't about change. I had tried to change on my own. Before I went to church, before I got saved, I, I had went through the motions. I had quit doing the things that I was doing. I, I had a desire within me. And, and I was trying to straighten people. I hear people all the time say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm straightening my life up. I'm trying to do better. I'm trying, I was talking to a fellow just the other day. He said, well, you know, I, I, and I didn't want to get too deep on him. And he said, well, you know, I, I, I read a little bit every once in a while. And he said, I try to be a good person. And I, and I threw a little bit in there. I said, but you know, we got to have that fellowship with the Lord. I didn't want to come right out and tell him what I'm telling him now. I'm going to work on him, though. But see, it's more than trying to be a good person. It's more than reading just a little bit of the scripture. And people equate that to salvation. But that's not salvation at all. Salvation is when God, the eternal spirit of God, comes in and he inhabits this dwelling place. We become truly the dwelling place of God. Amen. God comes into our heart. So what this individual, what I'm reading here in verse 44, this demonic force, this spirit came back. And there was nothing there. See, there's always something that fills the void. You can try to reform your life. You can try to do things better. You can try to make your life better. You can try to be a good person. But unless, and you can get rid of all those things that you think that shouldn't be there. But unless there's something that comes in and fills that void, anytime there's, anytime there's a vacuum or anytime there's a void, something always fills it. So this the demonic power, this spirit came back and found that this person had reformed, but yet there was still nothing there. They had changed, surely they had changed. It said it was clean and garnished and swept and there was not, it was all, but nothing had come in to inhabit. Now if this individual had, been, had allowed the spirit of God to come in, then when this demonic force came back, it would find no place there to go. It would find that, that this space was taken up. But yet it come back and found this place empty. Listen, it's futile. It's a waste of time to try to make self-improvements. The only thing that can truly help us, you say, how, how do I do that, Brother Reed? How do I find that place in my life to allow the Spirit of God to come in? The Bible is very clear and it's very easy. We ask God to come in. We say, we ask Him to forgive us, first of all. We acknowledge that we're sinners, first of all. And then we ask Him to come in. And then when we accept Him as our Savior, something happens, something changes. Amen. But here's what most people miss out is there's got to be change in our life after that point. If we don't change completely, if our desire, when I got saved, when I was filled with the Holy Ghost, my desires changed. Yeah. I wanted to read the Word. I wanted to study the Word. I wanted to seek out the things of God. As I said a while ago, I, I had a desire to embrace the things of God. And then verse 45 says, Then the Spirit goeth in and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there, and the last state of the man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Now again, I always thought the context was dealing with the individuals. But the context of this scripture, Jesus is talking about the nation of Israel. He's talking about the people of Israel. He's talking about a nation, a group of people. Yes, this is fundamentally true on an individual basis as well, but also it is, fund it is the context of what he's talking about. It's talking about a nation. And, when I, and he's talking about the nation of Israel because the last part of that verse says, even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. He's talking about a group of people. He's talking about a na this nation of Israel. But when I, when I first read this scripture, and the Lord was dealing with me with it the other day about it, I was thinking about the United States. 
I was thinking how this nation fundamentally, the foundation of this country was based upon the scripture. They had the biblical, even our constitution is based upon biblical principles. And as, as our nation began to was born and began to grow and mature, what did we see happen? People are always talking about, well, you know, the, the social injustice and all the things that we see taking place. They can, we, can, we can correct, as a nation, we can correct every social injustice that there is out there. But if we don't fill that void with something, if our nation does not fill that void with Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ has to be the thing that comes in and fills that void. But what did we see happen over time? A nation that was established upon the principles of God, they've tried to make self-help improvements and reformation down through, down through the history of our nation. But what happened, it was within their own ability, within their own doing, and what they done instead of drawing closer to God, they moved away from the Scripture. They moved away from the things of God. They felt like they had reformed. They felt like they were making changes from the civil rights movements of the 50s and 60s to women's rights of the 30s and 40s. And they felt that they made progression and they felt that they made reformation. But what they done when, as this nation began to reform and they began to move out those things that they thought were bad, they began to, end, they began to clean out things. They began to remove things. But what they left was an empty space. Because what they've done as these things happen, they push God out. They push God aside. Amen. Now, if you think about this nation back before that it became a country, before it was the colonies of Britain, this nation was a hedonistic nation. It was under the native people. It was under the, the, the native Indians and whoever else lived here before that. So it was a heathen. They worshipped the sun and they worshipped the animals and they worshipped all of these other things. It was a heathenistic nation. This nation started out that way. They, this nation started out with these demonic forces and these things going on in this country. And then there was reformation when the, when the colonies were established and we became the United States of America. All for, two, that, for 200 years, there's been reforming taking place. But he says here that the last state of this country, the last state of this generation will be worse than the first state. So what is he saying? He's saying that this country, if we put it in a pot to the United States or any other country, any other nation, it's saying that the, the, the last state of this nation will be even worse than the first state. Not, not the colonies, but even before the colonies. When this nation was, was ruled by people who served and worshipped idol gods. Any nation, any country, just like the nation of Israel. When they came, when they came in from Eden, when they had wandered around through the wilderness for 40 years, and they came to the promised land, who was... Who was the promised land inhabited by? Heathen nations, people who served and worshipped the, the, the idol Baal and all these other Astaroth and all these other idol, idol gods. They, they served all these heathen, they served all these heathen gods. And so Jesus is saying basically what he's saying, uh, the context of the nation of Israel, he said that your last state, the condition that this that the nation of Israel ends up in will be far worse than it was before they even entered in to the promised land. You understand what I'm talking about? Yes, when they first went in, things were going good, just like this nation. But he says the last state of the nation of Israel, the last state of, of the, the, the United States of America will be worse than the first state. The worst condition that, was, that it was when before we ever come over here and established the colonies. Because any nation, any group of people, any person that has experienced the good things of God, has been accustomed to being in the presence of God, has felt the anointing, has felt the things of God, has heard the word of God. They always stand in jeopardy. A person, a group of people, or a nation, a country, if they, if they, if they turn and revert back, if they sweep out things and make reformation, make changes, 
and they don't fill that void with Jesus Christ, they always, I've seen this over and, in, over, and over again in individuals' lives, but I see it taking place in a nation. I see it taking place in our country. I see it taking place around us every day. Turn on the news and we see a nation that is turning and reverting back to idol worship. Because the truth is, I mentioned a, a few sermons ago, I think it was the seven, seven uh, distinctions or the seven things that, that dis, denote Baal worship. But honestly, the word Baal means master. Did you know that? The word Baal means master. So anything that we make our master whether it's an addiction, whether it's work, whether it's a car, whether it's a wife or a husband, whether it's our children, whether it's anything. If anything that we make our master becomes our God, Baal. Because that's what the word means. It means master or to be mastered. So if we make Jesus Christ our master, then he is our master. But if we make anything other than Jesus Christ our master then it becomes a bell to us. This, these, these three little verses right here, these three little verses, Christ is pronouncing judgment upon the nation of Israel. But I think the application goes far beyond the nation of Israel. I think it goes to any country, as I've already said, I think it goes to any nation, any country, any group of people that try to make self-reformation, that try to change on their own without filling that void with the Holy Ghost. This, this, this thing is real. Amen. Being filled with the Spirit of God is absolutely real. I can stand up here before you today and tell you that God has filled me with His Spirit. That serving God is real. That the, the things that we find in God's word are not just some kind of make-believe, some, kind of, some kind of story that people have made. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. We've heard that our whole life, but I'm telling you, it's real. The very least that I could see in my mind is somebody is maybe contemplating that idea or not quite understanding that idea would be to have at least a curiosity of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And to me, I, I see that within myself. I would think, if these people, they're talking about it. And there's something going on in their life. I can't quite put my finger on or I can't, can't quite understand. I feel like that I would at least, if I would be in that group of people, I would at least have a curiosity to, under, to say, well, I want to find out what's going on, you see. See, that's just, I just, I'm kind of inquisitive like that. If I'm out hunting or whatever I'm doing, if I'm out in the woods, you know, well, I want to see what's around the next corner. I want to see what's over on the other side of the mountain. I want to see what is up this holler. I've always had that curiosity about me. Sometimes curiosity killed the cat. And sometimes it's got me in trouble. But I have to say when serving the Lord, I want to find out what it means to live for God wholly and surrender to Him completely. I want to find out what it meant to be filled with the Spirit of God. Oh, when I first got saved, I remember just a month or two, me and Tammy was, was just dating then. And I know I've told this story before. Now see, it got, I was saved and filled with the Spirit, but God put something else. People think, well, I got saved 50 years ago and they've never sought God for anything else after that. See, there's gifts, there's things that He puts in our life after, after that initial feeling, that initial salvation. I was kneeling down a, a, maybe a month or two. God was already filling me with his word. I was soaking it in. Me and, me and Tammy was dating. I was reading books. I was listening to, to tapes. I was just soaking it in and absorbing it like a sponge. But one day, just nonchalantly, I knelt down at a chair in, in front of a chair in my house when I was still living at home. And didn't feel anything. But I started, I opened my mouth. And the next thing I know, I was out in the spirit. And when I come to, I was speaking in tongues. And speaking in an, another language. I didn't have no control. God took me somewhere. He put, he put those gifts within my life. And so when I, I, we never should think that, oh, but I knelt down at the altar and that's all there is. We should, we should be seeking the things of God every day. Because sometimes I've heard Brother Lottie say, we may have a bucket that's got holes in it and it leaves.
leaks out because it does. There's the problems of life, the things that go on in our life. Sometimes we get a little bit weak. We should never stop seeking God for that refilling of the Spirit of God. Amen. But see, people don't. They don't do that. And they want you see people reverting back to that same behavior that they had before they ever knelt at the altar. And then what they end up doing is they end up self-reforming. And they hold on as long as they can. I'm, I'm here to tell you, whoever may listen to this, you can't hold on by your own strength. Right. It's impossible. It takes something within your very being to change who you are. Paul said in Romans 6 verse 11, Romans 6 verse 11, he said, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead to sin. See, that's the door. Don't, don't expose yourself to the door. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, that you should obey it in its lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. See, we was reading there in Matthew, and it said that he cleaned it, he swept it, and it was empty. But what Paul is saying, he said, once, once that's happened, once we've emptied ourselves of everything, then we must let the Spirit of God, we must let the righteousness of Jesus Christ come into our life and anoint our life and fill us and fill that void because he said you were once dead in trespasses and sins, but he said you are now alive through Christ Jesus. Yes, Verse 14, he says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. What happened in the story of Matthew 12? Paul says, for sin shall not have dominion. Something will dominate your life. Something always dominates your life. Did you know that? There's always something that dominates you. If we allow the enemy to dominate us, then he'll dominate us. He'll become our bell. But if we allow the Spirit of God, if we are filled with the, with the Spirit of God, if we are filled with the Holy Ghost, then guess what? He dominates our life. He says, for, you, for sin shall not have dominion over you. If this fella had accepted Jesus Christ, if he had filled that void or this nation or this... Listen, if we if the, as a nation... I know this may be on a lot of people's minds. It certainly is on our, my mind a lot of things that, we, that are going on. But if our nation would, would stop this self-reformation junk and, and stop trying to do things to reform society and be filled, be filled again, be filled with the Holy Ghost. If, they, if our governments, if our homes, if our schools, if our governments would be filled, if our presidents, if people would be filled with the Holy Ghost, then brothers and sisters, we wouldn't have to have social reform. We wouldn't have to have, there would not, there would not be all these social injustices. There would be people, and you know the problem, and I'm, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but the problem is not just in the secular world. The problem is in religion. It's, really, it's in churches all across the land. Well, if we can feed the hungry, if we can clothe those who are naked, if we can send out missionaries, then, then we, can, we can accomplish the work of God. But truly, you've got people going out that are just self-reformers and they're trying to go out and, and try to self-reform other people. Unless they are truly filled with the Holy Ghost, they're wasting their time. Amen. Verse 15 says, But then shall we... It says, what then shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace. He says, God forbid. That's a rhetorical question. He says, know you not that you that to whom you yield your yield yourself servants to obey his servants, ye are to whom you obey. See, he was talking to him in, in Matthew 12 again. It was, he was talking about the nation of Israel. That's the context of the verse. But we can put it in, in, the, in, in an individual term as well. He says, whoever you obey, that's who your master is. Who you, who you serve. People say, well, I don't serve Baal. I don't serve Satan. Was God number one in your life? I have to ask you. 
Is God the most important thing in your life? Being obedient to the things of God, is that the most important? We're going to read, I can't get away from the book of Isaiah. Every time I turn around, I'm going right back, and I'm now I'm in a study in the book of Isaiah. It's one of the most astounding books of the Old Testament. It's really one of the most astounding books. I, I can't remember all the figures, but it's quoted so many times in the New Testament. Paul quotes it over and over again. It's in the book of Revelation over and over again. It's an astounding book. It tells everything from the Messiah. It tells everything about the end time. It tells everything about the whole picture. See, in the whole Bible, how many, how many books are in the Bible? 66. How many chapters are in the book of Isaiah? 66. So it's kind of an overview or outline of what God has done with humanity all the way through the end. Verse, verse 16, before we go there. Know you not that to whom, I want to read it again, to whom you serve, to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Paul said in Romans 8 and 7, you don't have to turn to it, he says in Romans 8 and 7, he says, because the carnal mind is an enmity, is enmity against God. That word enmity, I know I've said it many, many times, it means at war, an opposition. The carnal mind is an opposition or it's at war with the things of God. It says, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Self-reformation, again, this goes right back to Matthew 12. Self-reformation cannot work. It cannot succeed. It can work for a time. But if we try to do it on our own self, because he says our carnal mind, our, our, our human way of thinking can never be subject. He's not talking about the laws of the Old Testament, but he's talking about the spirit of his word. He says he said that the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, I'm not talking about the law of the Old Testament, but he's talking about the, the law of God that, that rejuvenates, that brings life, that, that the Spirit of God that brings life. He says our carnal mind is at war against the Spirit of God, against the mind of God, against the things that God wants to do. Our carnal way of thinking is at war with the things of God. He says it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And Ephesians 2, 15, 16 says this, before we go to Isaiah 1. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 15, 16, he says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Now Paul just said in Romans Romans 8 and 7, he says that the carnal mind is in, at enmity or at war with the mind of God. But Paul said, he goes on to say in the next book, Ephesians, later on down the 